Okay, so uh, we'll, we'll start here in just a moment. If we could uh, open up our Bibles, if you can open up your Bible to 2 John, and we're going to read in verse 7. At, we'll pray first, but after we pray, then we're going to be in our notes. We're going to start on page 6, and then we're going to kind of fly through the rest of this uh, chapter that we were in. But we, I just want to, we're going to just hit something quickly there at the end of this chapter we were talking last week about Constantine and his vision in the sky and then the uniting of the church with the state okay um all right so uh good to good to have you out there this evening uh for our second week of church history too and uh, good to see Brother Tim Stalkup. Brother Tim, could you lead us in prayer as we begin tonight? Absolutely. Let us look to the Lord in prayer. Heavenly Father, we thank you that you uh, have ordained the church. You have created this institution. And Lord, we thank you for the history, the heritage that we can look back on. Lord, I pray that even tonight we would be encouraged as we see back in history uh, the those who have opposed your work and those who have pressed onward and forward uh, to carry on with the truth and there have been uh, so many that have have uh, fought against the the true church and tried to corrupt the true church and and yet we thank you that we can learn from that and that we can see that you have uh, preserved this institution even through to till today and and so uh, would you bless Pastor Recker as he teaches us these things, and may we glean what you want us to from your word as well. In Jesus' name, amen. 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 So the big picture idea of this hour tonight is we're going to see after three centuries where the church was being persecuted off and on by the Roman government, what we're going to see now that they have a religious freedom, they're going to really go to war amongst themselves, especially over essential doc doctrine. And we're going to talk about some of these councils that took place over some of these theological battles. And there's a lot going on here. But what we can also say is this, that from the beginning, Christianity it, we have to have a war, a wartime mentality. We, we are soldiers of Jesus Christ. And we, there will always be controversy as a Christian. If you don't want controversy, don't be a Christian, <laughs> really. Because you, we have to stand up and fight for the truth as Christians. And so we'll, we'll see some of that tonight. So we're going to start reading a few of the verses. Uh, 2 John, verse 7. And just to see how there's false teachings, even in the New Testament era, that have come in. And now we're going to see these false teachings begin to really flourish as we go into the 4th century, into the 300s of church history. Okay, so Sid, could you read uh, 2 John and verse 7 and uh, 8? Why don't you read verse 8 as well? Sure. 2 John 7 to 8. For many deceivers are entered into the world who confess not that Jesus Christ is come in the flesh. This is a deceiver and antichrist. Look to yourselves that we lose not those things which we have brought, but that we receive a full reward. And, and notice in the next verse too, what is the doctrine that is all essential to us as Christians? In verse number nine, what does it say? Doctrine the doctrine of Christ. The doctrine of Christ. And, and even there, he says, the deceivers are entered into the world. What don't they confess? That Jesus Christ, Jesus is his earthly name. Christ is his messianic title. That he's fully God and totally man. That's the battle. That's the first theological battle the church really is going to go through in this council of Nicaea. Okay, look at Third John and... And Carrie, why don't you read verse 9 and 10 as well of 3 John, verse 9 and 10. 
And this is also a theological battle of what's going on. In other words, the, the religious authorities are becoming diatrophies. So let's read about diatrophies. Third John verses nine and 10 reads, I wrote unto the church, but diatrophies who loveth to have the preeminence among them receiveth us not. Wherefore, if I come, I will remember his deeds, which he doeth, prating against us with malicious words and not content therewith. Neither doth he himself receive the brethren and forbidden them that would and casteth them out of the church. Okay, so church bosses. A church hierarchy is going to develop where there's so much power at the top. Beginning with Constantine, but then the bishops of the church had a growing power. Okay, so, and then we read in Jude, verse 3 and 4. And Douglas, if you could read those verses for us. And this is a real call to arms, spiritually speaking. We're in a spiritual battle. Douglas? Jude 3 and 4. Beloved, when I gave all diligence to write unto you of the common salvation, it was needful for me to write unto you and exhort you that ye should earnestly contend for the faith which was once delivered unto the saints. For there are certain men crept up in unawares who were before of old or ordained to this condemnation, ungodly men turning the grace of our God into lasciviousness and denying the only Lord God and our Lord Jesus Christ. Okay, so this is what was going on in the 300s in the 4th century at the Council of Nicaea. They were denying the Lord Jesus Christ. And thank God there were some who stood up for the truth and preserved sound doctrine for us. In spite of all of the other political drama that was, was happening. Okay, so I want to, we're going to get into that in just a moment, but I want to just kind of wrap up with what we were talking about Constantine last week. We talked about his vision that he had in the sky. And we said, is, was it a fraud? Was it, was it a dream? It's really impossible to say for sure. But I don't believe that Constantine was truly saved. I will say that. I believe that he was a shrewd politician and not a sincere believer. That's my understanding about Constantine. He never, he never put himself under the authority of a local church. He was not baptized until the very end of his life. On his deathbed, he was baptized by a man named Eusebius. And I, I gave you fake news last week. I, I, I gave you fake news. I said he was baptized by Sylvester. So scratch that. You probably didn't even write it down. You probably don't even remember. But I remember what I said. And, it, and, and I'm going to show you that that is legitimately fake news, too, because that lie was spread later on. Sylvester was the bishop of Rome, but he got baptized by Eusebius of Nicomedia. Um, and Eusebius of Nicomedia was an Arian. He denied the true person of Jesus Christ. He did not believe this Eusebius of Nicomedia is not Nicom uh, Eusebius of Caesarea. He was a historian. There's two Eusebiuses, okay? So one was a historian, Eusebius of Caesarea. This is a, he was a bishop and he was an Arian. He denied the deity of Jesus Christ. And Constantine, we're going to see, is a flip flopper. He, 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 at the Council of Nicaea, he stood for the true doctrine of Christ, but he flip-flopped and at the end of his life got baptized by somebody who was basically a Jehovah Witness, okay, <laughs> which is Arian doctrine in our day and age, Jehovah Witnesses. They deny the deity of Christ. So that's one thing about Constantine. But you know, he believed in the power of Christ, but he also believed in the power of the sun gods. He believed that, that multiple gods could help him. So he never stopped from his pagan ideas. And yet he had power over the church. And that's what's so amazing to me that even godly men, because of the wealth and, the, and some of the good things that that Constantine did, I mean, he gave them freedom. He allowed them to have freedom. That I believe that 
that kind of blinded them to some extent. And so it kind of shows me too that we always have to be, we have to always go back to the word because all of us are influenced by our culture. And I believe that even godly men were wrongly influenced by the wealth and the gifts of land and buildings that Constantine gave. And then they compromised in doing that and gave him power to actually have power and authority in the church when he wasn't even a believer. And it united the church and the state, which is to me, one of the greatest evils that a church could do is to unite with political powers and then let political powers control you. I, I, we don't want the money. We don't want money from government. That's why I'm a Baptist, by the way. Baptists have never united with the power of state. So that's what's going on here. And um, I wanted to clarify that about Constantine. Did anybody want to say anything? Now, I know Ruth and Sid, you watched a video. Did you want to give a little report at, at all about that? Do you, do, you think it, do you think his vision was a fraud based on the video that you saw? Which is okay if you do, because, you know, I wasn't there. So what did you think, Sid? When you, Sid watched a video. It was pretty interesting. Did you want to give anything? Uh, um, but we, well, it was a very interesting um, documentary because, um, so basically what the point was uh, that uh, he, he actually didn't see the vision, um, yeah. but he, in the first time that he sh shared this with, I think it was also UCBS, UCBS yeah, yeah. the historian, um, he, he didn't say anything about the, anything about the vision, um, but he would refer to all of his pagan beliefs. And then the second time, um, he, he actually added that story and um, the point was uh, it was for him to win um, the whole the Christians in, in the other camp in the, the other army other army but anyways but um, the, to cut this short the, the Christianity that he posed to the world was not actually the Christianity that is connected to Christ the Christian to the Bible but it's more of like a, um, a fusion of uh, Apollos and Mithras pagan, his no. pagan beliefs. I mean, it, it, that's what happened because really pagan ideas and pagan worship flooded into the church. And Roman Catholicism is really a paganized form of Christianity. That's my understanding of it. Even, you know, even how Roman Catholicism is structured to this day, it's not structured like a church, it's structured like the Roman Empire. You've got the Pope like the Caesar. And you have cardinals like like kings and you have bishops like the governors. You know, we talked about the Roman, the, the Roman government and their structure. I mean, so it's not structured like the Bible where you have pastors and deacons and so forth. And then all of the other pagan ideas of the worship of the queen of heaven and so forth. Um, I did see a part of that video that they're referencing and it was interesting and I'm not certain about the vision, whether it was a fraud or not. Some people say that the whole army saw it, so I don't, I don't know. But what they did bring out about this video is there's, a, there's an arch to Constantine that goes back to that period of time. And it kind of shows you what was happening historically at that time. And it even shows you some of the soldiers and their shields that they were fighting in that battle that Constantine won. And there was no evidence on that arch, even on the shields of their being the sign of the cross. So, I mean, they use that to say that it, it, didn't, it didn't happen. So I'm just, I'm just throwing it out there, um, but I'm not certain. That was true, right? What I said about the, the, the video? Yes, Pastor, but also the Ark was, um, was commissioned by him, so by, it was kind of compelling. By Constantine. Yes, yes, yeah, it was commissioned. Yeah, it was, it was from, from his day and era. Yeah, so it was... Um, On that same video, did they have a lot of pagan gods? Uh, I, I didn't watch the whole thing. I, I just watched, watched the video. Yeah, I watched some of it, and it was saying, I was like, am I watching the right thing? It was saying, like, a lot of the drawings, they were naming the pagan gods that were like... Um on the floor and, and why, why he was getting these two peaks. So there was wondering, like, yeah. yeah. Constantine was a pagan, I believe. Mm -hmm. Okay, so I just wanna finish uh, this 
chapter up real fast and we'll, we'll get more back to this but uh patrick is it because it talks about how the gospel was spreading and and how people were you know there's so much going on in history and i'm not i'm not the greatest historian but europe was changing like crazy at this time as well between the three four and five hundreds and there was mass migrations movements of of people and and so it's just basically saying that they were trying to bring the gospel do you know though that patrick and i'm talking about saint patrick from saint patrick's day do you know that he was a baptist he was not a catholic so and i put this in your notes he was born in britain he was a missionary to ireland and the book actually does reference him as well that he was taken captive enslaved by by pirates for six years and prayed for release and then he got released and god called him to go to ireland he only baptized believers and that by immersion that's in your notes he recognized the scripture as the supreme authority in faith and practice not the church there's no trace in patrick of purgatory or mariolatry or worship of mary and he was declared a saint by the Roman Catholic Church as a political move for the people of Ireland to embrace Catholicism because he was so popular. Um, actually, it's very, um, it's very different than any of the other. It's very, um, it's, it's nothing, nothing, um, it didn't, not fancy, you know? oh, it didn't look like a Roman Catholic. So Esther's saying she went to his cathedral in Ireland and it, it looked more Baptist than Catholic. Uh, I'm kind of adding to it. I, I put, I, I, she didn't really say it that way. Uh, yeah. Okay. And then another man, uh, Columbo, went to Scotland. And Columba, not Columbo. Columba went to Scotland. And on the day of his death, he was translating the Bible, Psalm 3410. It's wow. uh, I read somewhere. Now, I'm just going to give you this, this uh, last two blanks here under letter D. And they really shouldn't be here. I, I shouldn't have this here, but you could just fill the blanks. And we'll talk about the Bogle Mills and Basil later. But Basil was actually 1070. So it, it's out of order. And you could just scratch, put a line through E and F for right now. Just put a line through that in your notes, scratch that. If I had to redo the notes, I would delete it, okay? Because it just doesn't, I, I'm not, that's from the old, my old notes, and I, I should have uh, edited that a little bit better. So, so I want to move on, though, to chapter 12 in our book. Okay, so in chapter 12, he talks about these different, the creedal developments and the, the controversies at these councils. So we want to talk about these councils a little bit. So the first one is this Council of Nicaea, which is perhaps the most important one. Have you ever heard of the Da Vinci Code? So it was a book, it was a movie. They made that all about, it was the biggest lie against the truth of Jesus Christ for what? I read the book. Actually, I listened to it, but. It was really a page turning book, interesting, but it was full of lies and it was a direct attack against the authority of the word of God. And one of the big lies that they tell in that is that Constantine collated the, the, the New Testament at the Council of Nicaea, that the Council of Nicaea was about picking which books of the Bible are gonna go into the New Testament. That's a total lie. The Council of Nicaea was nothing about what books of the Bible belong in the New Testament? It was all about the person of Jesus Christ and who he was. Okay, that's, that's the first thing. This council was to establish the divinity of Christ, which was being challenged by Arianism, which was a denial of Christ's deity. Many of the bishops attending this council bore the marks of persecution from the time that happened just I'm talking 15 years before the council. They were, they, they were under persecution 15 years. This was in 325. So 
Remember the Edict of Milan was 313. So this is 12 years. Before that, Christianity was outlawed and persecuted. One of the bishops at this council was missing an eye. Another bishop had both of his hands crippled and others bore the marks of, of the persecution on their body. So there were godly men who were leaders of churches at this council. But Constantine was presiding over this council at the same time, which is not a good thing. And he paid for all of the costs of the council. And I believe that there, there was, that Constantine swayed some of these good men with money and power. I do believe that happened. So for Constantine, he, his, his motive was to maintain political peace. And in calling this council, it ultimately would cost the church its independence. And the emperor will have power over the church to, de, to depose and, and send pastors into exile or appoint pastors to churches. And think of that, that the church, if the church doesn't have power to call its own pastor, but the government is going to tell the church, what pastor? They, that's not Baptist. <laughs> this is not. It's not Bible. Okay. So this is the Council of Nicaea. So here's what's going on here. Uh, Arius is letter A. He was a presbyter of Alexandria, Alexandria, which is in Egypt. He was backed by this man, Eusebius. There's that name, Eusebius of Nicomedia. He's the one who ultimately is going to baptize Constantine. And Eusebius of Nicomedia, being backed by Arius, insisted that Christ did not exist from eternity, but he had a beginning by the creative act of God. So Arius, he didn't believe that Jesus was just a man. He believed he was more than a man. He believed he was more, but he was a created man. But he would, you know, when he was created in heaven, but he had a beginning. So he denied the eternality of Jesus Christ. Now, why, why would they do that? What was the motive? If you look in your book on page 125, the main motive of Arius is they believe if, if you teach that Jesus Christ is God and the Father is God, then what kind of a religion are you? <clears throat> what are the last three words that he saw as the danger in that next to last, that last full paragraph on page 125? Party. The danger of what? Party. So they saw if you teach that Jesus Christ is God, you will fall into a, you will no longer be a monotheistic religion. And we know based on scripture, how many gods are there? There is one god that is absolutely certain so if you say that the father is god and jesus is god you are polytheistic so that that's what what was motivating the arrogance so then we have oh by the way so this is this is a picture of you know it's just a painting of the Council of Nicaea, and you see the guy at the bottom, he has his ear, his hands over his ears. That's Eusebius of Nicomedia, according to the, that he didn't want to hear the, uh, the other bishops, what they were saying. Because the Arians argued, this was their argument. There was a time when he was not, that's what they would chant. There was a time when he, Christ, was not. Now, was there ever a time when Jesus was not? No, yeah. he's eternal. Okay, so, but that's what Arius believed, that Christ is a created being. And then we have, on the other side of Arius, arguing against him, a great defender of the faith named Athanasius. Now, Athanasius was from Africa. They say he was short and dark-skinned, and some called him the black dwarf. 
but he was a giant of orthodoxy and he helped to define the true person of Christ during this great Arian controversy. Later on, he would become the Bishop of Alexandria. He was not the Bishop during this council, but he would later become, but he was a chief spokesman for this Orthodox view for throughout his life. He taught that Christ existed from all eternity and he was of the same essence And put this somewhere in your notes. Where do you see where it says of the same essence? Put maybe under underneath that, or the same substance. That's the kind of language they use. The same substance as the Father. Although he is a distinct person, but he is of the same essence or the same substance. Now look in your look in your book here. And at the bottom of page 126, just so you kind of see, um, your book has a, a lot of this information. But at the bottom of page 126, you see it says Arius was backed by who? Yeah, Eusebius of Nicomedia. So that's what I, and then, and then distinguishing that from the historian. Okay, Christ had not existed from all eternity, but had a beginning. So, and here's the key. Okay, go to page 128 at the top. Arius believed Christ was of a what? Different essence. essence or substance. Okay, so those are the two words that I gave you as well in your notes. So underline that. Arius believed that Jesus was of a different essence or substance. And if you go down... In the page, you see that the, uh, the next paragraph down, it begins with Athanasius and when he lived, 296 to 373. So by the way, 296, he, he was born when the church was still being persecuted. When he was a teenager, it was the Diocletian um, persecution, which was perhaps the worst persecution that the church ever endured when he was a teen. So he lived through it. So he said that Christ... If you go down, you see where it's a full length uh, of that line. It says, at the council, the young man, slightly over 30, insisted Christ had existed from all eternity with the Father and was what? Of the same essence. Okay, so underline that. So Arius said Jesus was of a different essence. Athanasius said he was of the same essence. Now, this, is, this gets confusing because we got Eusebius of Nicomedia, but now we got Eusebius of Caesarea. <laughs> he was the historian. He was, he was a little wimpy. He was trying to, you know what he wanted? He wanted peace. Let's just be a, let's just, let's just like find a compromise we can all agree on, you know? <laughs> let's have peace. So he said that, and the next paragraph down you see the largest party led by this gentle scholar church historian Eusebius and he was very pro-Constantine by the way he said if you go down in that paragraph what does it say Christ was of a like or what does it say similar see where it says similar so underline that similar essence to the father so the Arian said that he was of a different essence Athanasius said he was of the same essence. Eusebius of Caesarea said he was of a similar essence. But the thing is, what's wrong with Eusebius of Caesarea there to say similar? If it's similar, is it the same? So therefore, it's different. <laughs> if, it's, if it's similar, it's not the same, and it's different. So there's really no difference between Arius and Eusebius of Caesarea. But what does it mean when he says the same essence or substance? What is he talking about? Is he talking about like material essence or substance? What, what does the essence mean? What does that mean? The same substance. Okay, this is their language. This is, okay, attributes that belong to God's essential, essential nature what are the attributes of god's essential nature that he is what god for god to be god he must be eternal 
So Jesus must be eternal as the Father is eternal. And what are the other attributes? You know what they are. Omni, omnipotence, omniscience, omnipresence, all wise. He doesn't change. Okay, so when, that's, that's the essence or substance they're talking about. So the, 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 the Nicene um, council went on and Athanasius would ultimately, a creed would come out that would bear his name called the Athanasian Creed. And he pronounced the true doctrine of Christ. He believed it was, he believed, and we believe it was essential to hold on that the very heart of Christianity was at stake, right? The heart of Christianity is at stake. When you, if you deny the, the eternality of Jesus Christ, there's a big difference between what we believe and what Jehovah Witnesses believe. Because really Jehovah Witnesses are modern day Aryans. They deny that Jesus Christ is God. They, Jehovah Witnesses say that Jesus Christ is created. John 1, 1, in the beginning was the word and the word was with God and the word was God. Jehovah Witnesses translate that a God. The word was a God. It's a wrong, it's a terrible translation. So Schaff includes the entire creed in one of his histories, volume three here, I have the page numbers. Here's a part of his creed. It's a masterpiece of logical clearness. He says, the creed that Athanasius said, we worship one God in Trinity, Trinity in unity, neither confounding the persons nor dividing the substance. For there is one person of the Father, another of the Son, another of the Holy Ghost. But the Godhead of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Ghost is all one. So they, they say, we worship one God. God is one. The, the glory equal, the majesty co-eternal, the Father is God, the Son is God, the Holy Ghost is God, yet there are not three gods, there is one God. Mm -hmm. So the oneness of God is not in the personhood. There's three distinct persons. And that, so what he says there, there's one person of the Father, another of the Son, another of the Holy Ghost. We cannot confound the persons. We must keep the persons distinct. So who died on the cross? The Father? No. Jesus died on the cross. Who sent the Son? Did the Son send the Father? No. The Father sent. They're, diff they're different persons. So this is the Trinity is very difficult to like fully grasp, but but this is what they this is why it became a controversy. But the oneness of God is in the essence. They're of the same essence or substance in in their attributes. Okay, so that's a little bit of that. Now, yeah, so, um, okay, so let, let me move on here to, oh, uh, letter C is Eusebius of Caesarea proposed this moderate view. He combined the ideas of Arius and Athanasius. Most of the bishops actually held to this view of compromise with heresy. So the bottom line, though, really, is that the Council of Nicaea didn't ultimately decide anything. And this battle was not going to be fully resolved until the Council of Chalcedon. If you look in, that's in 451. So that's 125 years later. Athanasius will be dead by then. But when the church will finally come to a full agreement on who the person of Jesus Christ is. And here's what they had. And, and some of these other councils, they're going to they're going to focus now about on Christ and who is Christ and how could he be one person and yet two distinct natures. OK, so when we talk about Christ, we have to accurately speak that way. He wasn't two persons because he had two natures. That, that is going to be a heresy in one of these councils. He's Jesus Christ is how many persons? He's one person, but he has how many natures? Two distinct natures, a holy divine nature and a human nature. So he's fully God and fully man, two distinct natures. And we cannot confound the natures with the person of Christ, just like we can't confound the persons with the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, with the natures of Christ. In a sense, we have to keep them separate. 
he's fully human and he's he's or fully god and perfectly human and yet he's one person <laughs> we cannot divide his person okay so this is kind of things that there will be arguing about so let's just go through some of these and you don't have to know all of the different points that we're going to talk here i'll i'll, I'll let you know in the uh, study guide what you have to know the council of constantinople is the one that happened after nicaea this was in 381 it was comprised of 150 bishops it enlarged the nicene confession uh, by an article on the, the divinity and personality of the Holy Spirit. It also condemned a view called Apollinarius. And just, just to read this for a second, just to see how complicated it gets, because I don't even fully understand some of this stuff. But look at the top of page 130, where it says Apollinarius. And uh, let's see. So, uh, Ruth, could you, could you read the top of page 130, Apollinarius developed? Can you see that at the top of page 130, Ruth? Sorry, Pastor, my our book hasn't arrived yet. Oh, okay. So, uh, Angela, you have the book? Angela, could you read at the top of page 130, Apollinarius? Yes, Pastor. Apollinarius developed his peculiar doctrine concerning the natures of Christ when he was about 60. Until that time, he had been a good friend of Athanasius and had been one of the leading champions of orthodoxy. In an attempt to avoid the undue separation of the human and divine natures of Christ, Apollinarius taught that Christ had a true body and soul, but that the spirit in man was replaced in Christ by the logos. The logos as the divine element actively dominated the passive element, the body and soul in the person of Christ. He stressed the deity of Christ, but minimized his true manhood. His view was officially condemned at the Ecumenical Council of Constantinople in 381. Okay, so, so you know, I read that, you know, I was like, you know what I thought to myself? I'm like, really? You made a big thing out of that and then they condemn this guy i mean he was 60 years old and he's changing his views around to some like weird ideas but i underlined the key point of that paragraph and i'm glad angela you read that because some of this reading is a little bit hard but it's good for us to think through about theology it's good to really think yeah when you do theology you have to really think but it says there that his teaching stressed what what does it stress what did it say in there in that paragraph it stressed what the deity but it minimized his what his humanity so in a subtle way that's why it was a heresy it minimized the humanity of jesus christ so don't ever change believe that he's fully god and he's perfectly and fully man okay <laughs> two distinct natures but one person so some of these uh, things are kind of like that. They're, they're very nuanced. So in the Council of Carthage, now 397, the Council of Carthage officially approved the New Testament canon. We talked about that before. And we, we mentioned Athanasius here. Athanasius stood up for the person of Jesus Christ. Athanasius, we referenced him in our previous class. Remember, he wrote a letter when he was the bishop of that, the church in Alexandria, Virginia, he wrote a letter to all the churches of every New Testament book, 27 New Testament books that are right in our New Testament. So, and that was in 367. And then it was officially confirmed in 397 at that council. Okay, so number four is the Council of Ephesus. And Rome came who were instructed not to mix in with the debates, but to sit as judges over the opinions of the rest. Papal, de I'm sorry, papal delegates from Rome came who were instructed not to mix in with the debates, but to sit as judges. So who's getting more power in these ecumenical councils as they're calling them? And they're being called by many times by Rome and being paid for by Rome. 
and they're getting more power. I'm sorry, the papal delegates from Rome. Yeah, that, that they're, they're getting more power. The, Ro the Roman Catholic system is getting more power and basically judging, not mixing in, but kind of like they're over, like the Roman Catholic Church is kind of looking at as themselves over. So here they condemn the error of Nestorius on the relation of the two natures of Christ, and they dealt with the Pelagian controversy. So I have underneath that what that is. Nestorius was a Christological theory denying the true union of the divine and human natures in Christ, affirming a twofold personality. So he was the Bishop of Constantinople. Constantinople was like the biggest church in the world at that time. That was in the city where Constantine moved the Roman capital to. So that was, that was a huge church, a very important church in Christianity at that time. But his view was condemned. So basically what he said was that Christ had Christ's two natures resulted in him being two, two people. So what do we say? He has two natures, but how many persons? He's one. So he said he's two natures, but each nature makes it a person. So he's two natures and two people. Okay. So that's kind of what Nestorius said. Now, Pelagius he, he, this is a theory of sin. So when Adam sinned, who's, did Adam's sin affect you or me? How, what does the Bible say? How does, how does Adam's sin affect us? For by one man, sin passed upon all men. So Pelagius says Adam's sin didn't affect anyone else except Adam. It affected only himself. The only effect of Adam's sin on his posterity, posterity is that he's a bad example, and man can be saved through self-effort. He denied that Adam's sin is imputed to all men directly. According to his view, man is born well, not a sinner. So basically, man is born kind of like Adam, and then we choose to sin like Adam. Okay? So that... Pelagius was this British monk. So this was a anthropological theory that is a, a false view of man. And this was condemned at also this council of Ephesus. And basically Augustine is gonna really uh, fight against Pelagianism. Have you ever heard of, um, there's certain evangelists in American history who were Pelagian, or at least it's sometimes called semi-Pelagian. In other words, place, um, Basically saying that man, you know, and it, it really gets to the whole idea. Uh, you know what? I'm going to leave that alone right now. I'm, let, let me move on. It gets, it gets uh, interesting, but I, we don't have the time. Okay. Council of Chalcedon, 451. This council fixed the Orthodox person, uh, doctrine on the person of Christ and what is called the Athanasian Creed. This was in opposition to the heresies of Eutychianism and Nestorianism. And this is also in the book. So, uh, uh, you don't, again, you don't have to know, you don't have to know Apollinarianism, you don't have to know Nestorianism and, and Eutychianism, but Eutychianism, he, so remember what we said about Nestorius, he said Jesus had two, two natures and he, he became two persons. Eutychian, Eutychianism said that his two natures, he had, his two natures blended together to form one nature. So he had one nature and one person. You see, so each guy had this whole, like his own nuanced view of things. So the true doctrine of Christ, however, after a hundred years of theological controversy, and I believe they got this right, in spite of being swayed by Constantine and his power and his gifts and so forth, but this is the orthodox position of, uh, of Jesus Christ, is that the orthodox doctrine forbids us to either divide the persons, he's one person, or confound the natures, he's two distinct natures, okay? So that's the last blanks there. 
I want to tell you a story and then we'll go. So it all got very dicey. After, for let me go back to the Council of Nicaea when that was over. Constantine and basically everybody agreed that Arianism was wrong. But after that council, Constantine flip-flopped because Eusebius of Nicomedia, some say was closely related to him, maybe even a relative of some kind. And he got close to Nic Constantine and he got Constantine to agree with his position. So much so that Constantine, that, that, this, that uh, this Nicomedia, Eusebius of Nicomedia, who was, he was the one pushing Arianism at the council, right? He got Constantine to send Athanasius into exile. So he got him thrown out of his church and into exile. On, and this went back and forth throughout Athanasius' life. Four different times he was thrown into exile. So the Arians sought to destroy Athanasius. But one time they accused him of killing an Arian bishop. They accused Athanasius of killing an, a, a bishop who was Arian. And then they accused Athanasius of cutting off his hand, killing him, cutting off his hand, and using it to do magic. So Athanasius, at the trial, brought the man he was accused of killing. And he, he had, a, he had a, a hood over him and, a, and, a, and a, um, a shawl or whatever. And so he, he, put, he showed back, to, he said, here's the man you accused me of killing. Here he is. I said, yeah, but let's look at his hands because you cut off his hand. So he showed his, his right hand. His right hand was there. So let us see his left hand. That's what they said. And he showed his left hand. And Athanasius says he doesn't have any more hands. You know, so I didn't cut off any hands. I didn't, cut, didn't kill anybody. But it was, it was that kind of ugliness that was going on. So here was the church for 300 years being persecuted. And now they're in a war against each other. And so... We have to stay in the word, stay in the word of God, and don't let the traditions of men deceive you. Okay. There is no class next week. We will have a quiz, though, in two weeks. I will send you out a study guide. Maybe even I'll send it out this week, but I'll, I'll send it to you a couple times. But uh, you know me, I like to send out emails. So, no. <laughs> okay. All right. God bless you. Don't cut off anybody's hand. Okay. Be good. Okay. Good night, Pastor. Thank you, every. Um, thank you, Pastor, and good night, everyone. Good night, good night guys. Good night, good night Pastor. Night, thank you. Everyone.